Hi everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Rajamandri, Andhra Pradesh. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. My email address is 3klpm at gmail.com. Today we are going to talk about a very very interesting topic, the stroke and hemiplegia part 5. We will be discussing the risk factors and ischemic penumbra. Cerebral infarction is mostly caused by thromboembolic disease secondary to atherosclerosis in the major extracranial arteries that is the carotid artery and aortic arch. So cerebral infarction is mostly caused by the thromboembolic disease secondary to atherosclerosis in the major extracranial arteries the carotid artery and the aortic arch. About 20% of infarctions are due to embolism from the heart. The cardioembolic stroke accounts for about 20% and another 20% are due to lacunar infarction that is small vessel infarctions very small less than 1.5 to 2 centimeters. So basically infarction is mostly caused by thromboembolic disease secondary atherosclerosis in the major extracranial arteries carotid artery and aortic arch and cardioembolic stroke accounts to for about 20% and lacunar infarction for about 20% of ischemic strokes. So what are the risk factors for ischemic stroke? The risk factors for ischemic stroke could be non-modifiable risk factors or modifiable risk factors. The non-modifiable risk factors are age. As people get older, as people get aged, the chances of atherosclerosis becomes increased and therefore elderly people are more likely to get ischemic stroke. Gender. Males have got a more tendency to get ischemic strokes as compared to females, women. Uh, women especially during the menstruation age group, they have high density lipoproteins. They have an increased levels of high density lipoproteins which protect them from the development of atherosclerosis. So the development of ischemic stroke is more common in men as compared to their uh, female counterparts. But then as the women become older and they attain menopause, they soon catch up with their male counterparts. So the protection is only for women during the menstruation age group. So gender males are more likely to get ischemic stroke as compared to women because they have the protection against the development of atherosclerosis. Obviously, if there are previous vascular events like myocardial infarction, stroke or peripheral vascular disease, the risk continues and they have more chance of getting ischemic stroke. Heredity. Sometimes the some strokes run in families because of hereditary reasons. So that is also an important non modifiable risk factor. The other risk factors are sickle cell disease and high fibrinogen. Yeah. Now let's talk about the modifiable risk factors where we can intervene and reduce the persons from getting ischemic stroke. So they are modifiable. These risk factors are modifiable. So what are the modifiable risk factors? Blood pressure. Hypertension is one of the most common and important modifiable risk factors for stroke. So hypertension is one of the most important and modifiable risk factors for stroke. Whereas for myocardial infarction it is dyslipidemia. So dyslipidemia is the most important modifiable risk factor for coronary artery disease and myocardial infarction. But for ischemic stroke it is hypertension. Hypertension is one of the most important modifiable risk factors for stroke. Very important for stroke. The most important modifiable risk factor is hypertension. For myocardial infarction, the most important modifiable risk factor is dyslipidemia. Heart disease, atrial fibrillation, congestive cardiac failure, infective endocarditis. In fact, atrial fibrillation 
carotid stenosis and hypertension are very important and common modifiable risk factors for stroke atrial fibrillation carotid artery stenosis and hypertension are the most important and most common modifiable risk factors for stroke so hypertension heart disease like atrial fibrillation congestive heart failure cardiac failure infective endocarditis and cigarette smoking cigarette smoking also increases the chances and propensity to the development of atherosclerosis and again it increases the chance for uh, increase the chance of getting ischemic stroke hyperlipidemia again can cause atherosclerosis diabetes mellitus again can affect the lipid levels dyslipidemia and can cause atherosclerosis excessive alcohol intake also again is a risk factor for ischemic stroke estrogen containing drugs like oral contraceptive pills are an important risk factor for ischemic stroke and polycythemia so these are all the important modifiable risk factors for ischemic stroke i repeat hypertension atrial fibrillation and carotid artery stenosis are the most important modifiable risk factors for ischemic stroke the other uh, factors being cigarette smoking hyperlipidemia diabetes mellitus excess alcohol intake estrogen containing drugs and polycythemia right now what are the compensatory homeostatic changes body always try to tries to protect itself the nature tries to protect itself and therefore it induces the compensatory changes so as to maintain homeostasis so what are the compensatory homeostatic changes forestalling infarction the most important compensatory mechanism is the development of collaterals opening of anastomotic channels from other arterial territories for example if middle cerebral artery is affected ch channels collateral channels may open up from pca posterior cerebral artery or anterior cerebral artery or between the internal carotid artery carotid arterial system or vertebro basilar system or between the internal carotid artery and external carotid artery so opening of anastomotic channel from other arterial territories collateral is very important compensatory homeostatic changes so if there are development of good collaterals the person developing uh, uh, an intense or a severe ischemic stroke becomes less these protect against the development of a severe ischemic stroke so one of the important uh, ischemia modifying factors are the development of collaterals second is vasodilatation so when the blood pressure is decreased and there's a decreased perfusion to the brain what happens is that the arterioles start dilating so as to allow more blood to be perfused to the brain so another important compensatory homeostatic change is that vasodilatation when the cerebral perfusion of the brain is decreased and uh, chance of ischemic stroke becomes increased the vessels arterioles start dilating so as to allow more blood to be perfused to the brain and therefore the chance of the brain developing uh, severe ischemic stroke gets reduced and third important uh, compensatory mechanism is increasing tissue oxygen extraction so brain tries to extract as much as oxygen possible from the oxygen flowing in the blood so increased tissue oxygen extraction so these are the initial compensatory changes that take place when a person is developing ischemic stroke but once these compensatory homeostatic changes that is the development of collaterals vasodilatation and increasing tissue oxygen extraction fail the process of ischemia starts so once these compensatory homeostatic changes fail the process of ischemia starts so we should know what is ischemic penumbra and the thresholds of cerebral ischemia 50 cc per 100 grams per minute is normal but when it comes to 20 cc per 100 gram per minute there is change in the electrophysiologic activity produces symptoms but even at this stage it is reversible and it is salvageable what we call it as ischemic penumbra the tissue that is ischemic and swollen but recoverable so when there is about when it drops to 20 cc per 100 grams per minute it is still ischemic and swollen but recoverable but when then it falls down to 10 cc per 100 grams per minute then there's a failure of ionic pumps potassium efflux 
sodium influx ischemic cascade leading to death so the infarct swells with time due to cerebral edema and is maximal in a in size in a couple of days after stroke onset and therefore persons may seem to be normal but after 2 to 3 days they may start deteriorating because of the development of cerebral edema the higher brain temperature higher blood glucose have been associated with the greater volume of infarction for a for a given reduction in cerebral blood flow that's why a lot of neurology intensive care units are air conditioned hypothermia is one of the important neuroprotectants so what is a neuroprotectant it helps the brain to tolerate hypoxemic conditions better so when the temperature is less when the when there is a low temperature brain tolerance of ischemia increases hypoxemia increases so they are all air conditioned and likewise we need to maintain a euglycemic state because the higher glucose blood glucose have been associated with the greater volume of infarction uh, and uh, and there is a hypoxemia also so there is anaerobic glycolysis lactic acid formation and it can be devastating and disastrous to the brain so what we are trying to uh, find out when we approach a case of ischemic stroke is that the damage is is getting done but what we are interested in is that ischemic penumbra so we are trying to protect that ischemic penumbra we are trying to salvage it by thrombolysis so when the blood flow to the brain gets reduced there's a center area which is totally dead it is known as infarction the surrounding area there is a decreased blood supply there is ischemia but still recoverable or salvageable and the third area overlying the ischemic penumbra is a normal tissue so we need not worry the brain is getting good blood supply so the brain which is the center part the 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 core part which is already infarcted nothing much can be done and the third layer it is already already getting good perfusion so we not really worry about it so what is causing concern what where, where we can really do uh, a beneficial therapy for the person for the patient where the brain can be salvaged is that the intermediate layer the ischemic penumbra where the tissue is ischemic but still salvageable so here when we start thrombolyzing the person the ischemic area recovers perfusion increases and therefore we can decrease the amount of damage done to the brain so ischemic penumbra becomes very important when we consider uh, therapy for ischemic stroke right so so far we have seen the risk factors for ischemic stroke now let's see the intracerebral hemorrhage which accounts to about uh, 10% so the risk factors for intracerebral hemorrhage are hypertension very very important so hypertension is an important risk factor for hemorrhage as well as ischemic stroke so hypertension becomes one of the most important modifiable risk factors for stroke i repeat hypertension was one of the most important modifiable risk factors for stroke and dyslipidemia is one of the most important modifiable risk factor for coronary artery disease or myocardial infarction so hypertension is a, is a very important risk factor for a hemorrhagic stroke in fact uh, the end arteries are likely to get damaged by hypertension causing charcot bichard aneurysm and causing hemorrhage so these are usually found in putamen pons thalamus and cerebellum and therefore when we see hemorrhage in putamen pons thalamus or cerebellum we know we know that it is a hypertensive bleed and we not uh, go extensively on investigations so when the hypertension when there is hemorrhage in these characteristic sites putamen pons thalamus and cerebellum it is a hypertensive bleed in fact the most common site for hypertensive bleed is putamen so hypertension is one of the most important risk factors for intracerebral hemorrhage the others being age high cholesterol complex small vessel disease with disruption of vessel wall uh, in elderly it is amyloid angiopathy especially when we find low bar hemorrhage impaired blood clotting persons may be on anticoagulant therapy for valvular heart disease or blood dyscrasias or thrombolytic therapy so this can cause impaired cl blood clotting mechanisms and there could be hemorrhage in the brain or vascular anomalies arteriovenous malformations or cavernous hemangiomas what is arteriovenous malformation generally when the blood flows to the artery 
it then goes to the arterioles a smaller sized vessel then capillaries then venules then veins so a blood has to cross through all these channels to enter into the vein from the artery but when there is av malformation there is no intervening tissue so there is a direct communication from the artery to the vein so blood gushes out from the artery to the vein and these can cause a rupture and hemorrhage arteriovenous malformation how do we diagnose it generally when we give a dye in a person who's got normal arterial and venous structure it takes some time for the dye to appear in the vein because it has to go to the arteries arterioles capillaries venules and veins so it takes some time for it to appear in the veins but if there is av malformation when we give a dye or a contrast it appears immediately in the veins early filling of the veins because there's a direct communication from the artery to the veins so it appears immediately in the veins early filling of the veins or early dilatation of the veins by which we can uh, diagnose that the person is having av malformation so av malformation cavernous hemangioma and substance misuse alcohol amphetamine cocaine all these also can cause intracerebral hemorrhage right the comparison of prognosis between intracerebral hemorrhage and ischemic stroke so which has got a better prognosis which has got a bad prognosis if hemorrhage is big enough it can cause raised intracranial pressure and death why are we worried so much about intracerebral hemorrhage because when the hemorrhage is present and the blood still starts leaking the pressure increases in the brain it can cause raised intracerebral hemorrhage and death because of herniation and because of the compression of the vessels and ischemic uh, or or hypoperfusion to the brain the two disastrous consequences of raised intracranial pressure one is the herniation of one part of the brain into the other part of the brain which it normally does not occupy uh, causing compression of the brain tissue second the intra increased intracranial pressure goes and compresses the vessel so there is hypoperfusion or decreased cerebral perfusion to the brain so if hemorrhage is big enough it can cause raised intracranial pressure and death so what is the prognosis for cerebral hemorrhage and infarction it depends upon the stage whether it is early or late the prognosis for cerebral hemorrhage is bad in the early phase because of the raised intracranial pressure but in the later phase the prognosis is better because of absorption of blood so when we take in the early stage the prognosis is bad for hemorrhage as compared to the infarction because when there is hemorrhage there is raised intracranial pressure and as i said can cause herniation and decrease cerebral perfusion and the death of the person but after some time what happens the hemorrhage the blood may start getting absorbed so brain becomes almost normal there is no real sequelae for uh, hemorrhagic stroke but when we take ischemic stroke the prognosis for cerebral infarct is good in the early phase because there is no raised intracranial pressure and therefore there are no consequences of raised intracranial pressure like herniation or decreased perfusion because of the compression of the vessels but but at a later stage what happens is that there is ischemia and infection infarction of the brain so there's already death of the tissue brain tissue so nothing much can be done so when we take uh, on a long term basis the prognosis is bad in ischemic stroke as compared to hemorrhagic stroke because in ischemic stroke the death of the tissue has already occurred but in the later phase the hemorrhage the blood starts getting absorbed and brain slowly recovers because it is only the hemorrhage so blood can get absorbed the brain is normal but in ischemic stroke the death of the tissue has already occurred so in the late phase the prognosis for cerebral infarction is poor as compared to the cerebral hemorrhage yeah these are all the important concepts of risk factors and ischemic penumbra i hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture as much as i have enjoyed delivering it uh, this is the focus a uh, neurology book i written i am the medical author of this book focus neurology where i put most the most of the concepts in a question and answer format it is available online from all leading books book stalls especially amazon you can book it online and i hope you have enjoyed this lecture on on stroke part 5 as much as i enjoyed uh, delivering it if you have any suggestions or comments kindly post on to my youtube channel but please like and subscribe my youtube channel dr sinwas medical concepts and my happy page